All right, uh, committee, we're back after a short break and we are taking up H210 that came to us from the House and we have Representative Lippert here to introduce the bill to us. So um, welcome, Representative Lippert. I know this is a bill critically important to you and um, I think it's gonna be important to us as well. So Good. please um, introduce yourself for the record and Great. We welcome your input. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Representative Bill Lippert, uh, chair of the House Health Care Committee, and was I was the presenter of H210 on the floor of the House. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the bill, and then um, I may... I'm also, our committee is also, of course, taking testimony this morning, so uh, I may not stay for the entire time, but catch up with you all later. But let me say that, yes, to H210, which is an act addressing health disparities and working toward issues of health equity, is a bill that uh, has, uh, that our committee, the House Health Care Committee, spent a great deal of time with, and it's an important bill uh, from, uh, in moving forward toward the kind of uh, health equity issues that we believe are critical for all Vermonters. I want to acknowledge at the outset that uh, while I was personally interested in beginning to address the issue of health disparities uh, in our committee, uh, we were the we were we took up H two ten, which was initially crafted uh, by uh, members of the affected communities, and particularly from the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, and. Uh, introduced by Representative Brian China as the lead sponsor. The bill as introduced uh, really focused on addressing, creating, uh, creating infrastructure. I would, I would describe it as an infra infrastructure for addressing issues of health disparities. We have a long section of findings, uh, which we, uh, we understand that sometimes findings are not seen as essential to a bill, but in this instance, it was very important for us to share with our colleagues uh, findings, which are each one of the findings is anchored in uh, documentation from either the Department of Health or other sources. And so we reintegrated the documentation into the findings. So, and there is also a separate single sheet with a series of links that could be made available to your committee. I'm sorry, I didn't think to make sure that was available to you today, but it, we found it of use because in each of the findings, there's a document and there's a link that you can go directly to that document. These findings uh, really anchor the bill in terms of issues of health disparities around race and ethnicity, the LGBTQ community, and the disabilities, people, Vermonters with disabilities. We know that COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic has made uh, painfully uh, clear the level of health disparities we have in Vermont, particularly around COVID and uh, race and ethnicity. What the, again, coming back, the bill is introduced, uh, immediately would have established an office of health equity within the Department of Health. Given the health department's 24 seven involvement in the pandemic, it was our conclusion that at this point in time, it was probably not realistic to ask the health department to take on a new initiative, even though this bill aligns very strongly with the health equity work that the health department of health has been doing for a number of years. And so while the bill asked to have an Office of Health Equity established immediately, it also called for the establishment of an advisory commission. And we made a decision in consultation with uh, the Office of Racial Equity and the Director of Racial Equity, who's here to join us, uh, to think about how to not simply not move forward because if we couldn't establish an office immediately, but instead look to establish the commission and to empower the affected communities who are the primary members of the commission. And to, and I wanna say, express our gratitude for the willingness of the Office of Racial Equity and Susanna Davis as the director to take, to contemplate taking on a transitional role of standing up the commission and then uh, 
using the commission to actually help think further about establishing the Office of Racial Equity, as well as looking to help establish uh, how we should move forward with cultural competency training for all healthcare professionals, as well as taking on its role of advising the General Assembly and advising the Department of Health uh, as well. There's also a data component. And again, we, uh, in, what is it, House Bill 315, we actually uh, appropriated some separate dollars as well for issues of, of data collection and alignment uh, because both proper collection of data around these issues, as well as uh, um, to be to ensure that data is collected and to ensure that it's the proper kind of data that it's not that it's disaggregated and it's not and that it should be studied and reported on on a regular basis. I would say that uh, the structure of the commission is more unusual than usual typically. Uh, has, is a large number, but it has many members of the affected communities as well as representatives of the state. But within the commission, we, uh, we uh, asked for an appropriation. Uh, well, let me back up and say that it would not have been realistic nor appropriate to ask for the Office of Racial Equity to take on this transitional role had there not been also a commitment to the staffing of two additional positions in the Office of Racial Equity, which now I believe is reflected in the House budget on an ongoing basis. And we advocated for that and said, if that was not in place, we wouldn't ask for any tra transitional role. But it was also not appropriate to give, to ask for this transitional role without additional resources. So $180,000 is appropriated uh, for the next fiscal year to support the Director of Racial Equity to hire in a manner that's determined uh, by that office, uh, staffing or consultants to help stand up the commission as well as to provide the support for the commission in its initial work, uh, as I've outlined it. I think the underlying issue, the underlying dynamic that we hope is reflected here is to uh, elevate the voices of the affected communities to empower those voices, those members to have a significant role in moving forward with developing the infrastructure to address health disparities. And we recognize that this bill uh, is in many ways modest in nature uh, and yet very significant in trying to establish infrastructure that will allow health disparities uh, to begin to be mitigated and addressed significantly over time. I think with that, that's uh, my general introduction to the bill. And we, 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 we are very pleased you're taking up the bill uh, today. And we look forward to working collaboratively along the way if there are ways to strengthen the bill. Thank you. Um, that's very helpful. And, and obviously, I know we've both been through some, dip, our, both of our committees have been through some uh, difficult times with the pandemic. And one of the, I just uh, will share. Uh, with folks, because some of our committee members are new, but one of the first things that we did during our discussion and our um, legislative work was to add in um, racial and ethnic um, disparity data collection for uh, COVID. And that has, I think, been an underpinning for a great deal of the work that continues to go on in the Department of Health. And we're we're, we, we are actually proud of that one, but this one seems like a, this bill um, will take us uh, giant steps forward. So, you know, thanks for your work on this. So we really appreciate it. I guess the question I have for you is, um, what was the vote out of committee? Oh, it, uh, I'm just not going to think. Uh, the, I think the vote out of committee would we. So just to put it in context, we have one member who is in leadership in the House and is does not participate in the committee. So there's always one person absent. Uh, so it, but it was a nine-one vote. Okay. Nine, one, one. Nine, nine, nine in one, favor, one, one opposed, okay. and one absent. And then how about the floor? Was it a voice vote or? It was a voice vote. It was a very strong voice vote. Okay. All right. And anything else, were there, were there folks uh, who testified who uh, were categorically against the bill in any way or were requesting I think, I think, specific changes? I think, there, 
I think it'd be fair to say, well, first of all, we heard from many members of the affected communities and that those, those were the voices that were most powerful for us to hear, uh, and both from the disabilities community, from, uh, we heard from the Racial Justice Alliance, we heard from uh, the LGBTQ community, we heard from the Abenaki community. Uh, I think there are those who feel like the bill should have been strengthened further by having an immediate establishment of the Office of Health Equity oh, and yeah. uh, that we should have immediately required uh, training for health professionals. It was our determination that the it was not, we were not going to be able to establish that office immediately. Uh, if you determine otherwise, we certainly would support that. Um, but uh, so I think there, there are those who would see the bill as wishing it had been enacted as introduced. Uh, but I think there were many people who also see this as a significant step. Yeah, okay. Yes, I can. The, did, you, did you hear from the Department of Health on the opening we did. up? Or? We did, yeah. we heard from the Department of Health initially. And one of the things that was most striking immediately was how, how in alignment uh, the structure of the bill was with the work of the, the health equity work of the department. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Heidi Klein, I believe, uh, yes. but what testified and, yes. uh, she, and we were both impressed and, uh, heartened by the efforts that had been put in place, but it also was clear that there was more that needed to happen. I, I would also just say that the initial, I think the, the initial, uh, absence of race data in terms of COVID was both an indicator of where, of why we need why we need to do more, uh, that that wasn't in place initially uh, was an indicator of the, exactly the challenges that uh, we're facing, uh, the structural failure to uh, include uh, race data, and uh, but then the subsequent commitment to making it uh, available and using that analysis, which then led to the understanding of the disparities. Without the actual data collected, we can't fully understand where the disparities lie. Which okay, then thank you. Hamstrings us from make, taking steps for further. Yeah. Okay, uh, committee questions for Representative Lippert. Go ahead, Senator Hooker. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Representative Lippert for bringing this forward. Um, my question is with regard to an Office of Racial Disparities, do you anticipate it? Office of Racial Equity. Our equity, thank you. Um, do you anticipate it being eventually in the Department of Health? Is that well? Interestingly enough, as the bill is introduced, made it clear that it should be in the Department of Health. Uh, testimony that we heard from, uh, well, we heard from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, as well as hearing from uh, Susanna Davis as the Director of Racial Equity, uh, who brought. Well, she can speak for herself, but uh, obviously <laughs> there are different different views as to where and how the office should be located. The bill introduced as says it should be in the office of in the Department of Health. Uh, we allowed for the commission to recommend uh, how that should move forward rather than us saying in statute at this point in time, okay. because there are. There are clear advantages. Uh, so some feel that there are advantages for being an independent office, such as the Office of the Healthcare Advocate outside of state government, and others feel like there should be, it should be within state government. I, I, I mean, I have my own personal view at this point, but the committee did not take a position, and I think there are a lot of reasons why uh, being working within state government uh, allows you to have a powerful access and influence, but it also could also um, at times have a uh, challenge in terms of uh, working within a structure that you may want to advocate to change or to influence. So the bill itself allows the commission specifically to uh, give direction on that. Thank you. Which I think is actually appropriate in terms of having the affected communities, which did help to introduce the bill. But at this point, I also think uh, once the commission is impaneled uh, to give them the ability to speak to that issue. Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thanks, Representative Lippert. 
for being here. Um, and <laughs> I, I just scrolling through the bill, there are 11 pages of findings, which I think is the most sure. findings I've ever seen in a bill. You yes. mentioned, <laughs> there's lots to find. Um, you mentioned that um, there was some document that goes with it that has hot links yes. to sources. Could you yeah. send that along to us? We will. Okay. I, I will make sure that's sent. Uh, in fact, I'll, when I get back to my screen yeah. <laughs> in my Zoom room, uh, I will ask to have that sent to you. Right. Uh, and just, just to say, you know, let, let me acknowledge that uh, there were some challenging questions asked. Uh, not everyone, uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of our committee strongly supported this bill. We believe that we, <laughs> this is a part of addressing issues of structural racism as well as broader disparities. Not, we found that there was some disagreement. Uh, and while I say we had the vast majority, we had a strong vote of nine members of our committee supporting this bill. We believe the findings anchor the very facts of health disparities. And for some members, we felt it was important in taking this to the floor of the house that there might be some members who questioned this. And uh, while our committee doesn't question this. It was, an, it was really an attempt to anchor the information in data. Rather, uh, in addition to the anecdotal, powerful anecdotal testimony as well. And I don't mean to demean that by saying anecdotal, but we've learned that data in addition to the lived experience and stories of, of individuals affected directly, uh, that, that becomes a powerful combination. And so that's why it is an unusual long, unusually long set of findings, but we felt it was essential. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, unless there are other questions for Representative Lippert, I'm going to suggest that we ask Katie McClinn to walk us through the bill, and then we'll hear from Susanna Davis. And Susanna, if you feel um, that your time is starting to... Uh, run away, um, let me know, please. Just raise your hand or send me a chat and we can, we'll interrupt the bill and, we'll, and we'll, we'll hear from you. But I thought it might be helpful for us to look at the bill first. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. And I, uh, Senator Lyons, uh, Katie and Susanna, uh, other committee members, uh, I, I mean, no disrespect, but I think I need to go back to my committee uh, and so I will follow up and make sure I understand what your discussion is here this morning and the further testimony. But uh, I, I, I appreciate you taking up the bill and, and uh, I look forward to us working together on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And then, uh, okay, so Katie, I know that you have a, you're, you're between, be, be, between shows. And you have a hard stop at 11. So uh, we'll, we'll go into the bill. And I think, <clears throat> I think rather than read each, each uh, finding and each uh, section of the bill to give us the more of a 2000 foot level, uh, just so we understand what is here. And I, we, we will definitely hear more testimony and take some time to go through the bill more thoroughly as we uh, continue our work on it. Okay. Sure. Let me pull up my screen. There we go. Are you seeing 210? Perfect. Okay. I see head nodding. Great. Um, so as Representative Lippert said, um, the first section is the finding section, and I'm just going to scroll through it for today. And it sounds like we'll come back to this at another point. Could you, I think maybe uh, there are some, there may be some things that are that should be highlighted. And if you, I can see what most of them are. And I think we've read most of it already, but. Well, I can tell you that the findings are broken down um, in part into categories because this bill um, focuses on health, health equity of various populations. So there, um, for example, is a section of findings on um, LGBTQ adults and also on LGBTQ youth there. Um, are findings um, organized by race and ethnicity. There are findings organized by Vermonters with disabilities. So um, the finding section makes an effort to provide statistics 
on the various, um, about the various populations and communities impacted um, by this, um, by this bill. Section two of the bill is on page 10. And this is a legislative intent and purpose section. I'll go through this that it's the intent of the General Assembly to promote health and achieve health equity by eliminating avoidable and unjust disparities in health through a systemic and comprehensive approach to address social, economic, and environmental factors that influence health. To this end, the General Assembly believes that equal opportunity is a fundamental principle of American democracy, equal enjoyment of the highest attainment, attainable standard of health is a human right and a priority in the state, uh, they believe that structural racism defined as the laws, policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other societal norms that often work together to deny equal opportunity has resulted in health disparities among Vermonters. Great social costs arise from these inequities, including threats to economic development, democracy, and social health of the state of Vermont. In subdivision four, um, the General Assembly believes that health disparities are a function of not only access to health care, but also social determinants of health, including the environment, the physical structure of communities, nutrition and food options, educational attainment, employment, race, ethnicity, sex, geography, language preference, immigration or citizen status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and socioeconomic status. So I'm going to. You want me to move through this more quickly? <laughs> no, 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 I don't. I want to go okay. back to number four very briefly. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I was going to ask a question about um, the, it says social determinants of health, including, but I'm not sure whether that, the including relates to social determinants of health because the, what follows are not social determinants of health. So I'm just thinking that we may want to clear that I'm just pointing that out right now. So we may want to clarify the meaning of that paragraph and to clarify what specifically are social determinants of health and what are not. Okay. Okay. I will flag that. Thank you. Thank you. In subdivision five, the general assembly believes that efforts to improve health in the U S have traditionally looked at the healthcare system as the key driver of health and health outcomes. However, there has been increased recognition that improving health and achieving health equity will require broader approaches that address factors that influence health. And lastly, the General Assembly believes that health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Health equity be can be achieved only by eliminating the preventable differences in the health of one group over another as the result of factors such as race, sexual orientation, gender, disability, age, socioeconomic status or geographic location. And then we have a purpose section. The purpose is to eliminate Can disparities. Can I ask a question? I don't wanna to interrupt too much, but I just wanna highlight some areas that I think our committee from the health and welfare, from the health and welfare perspective. So it goes into dis disability and age, and then it says socioeconomic status or geographic location, which might suggest, um, uh, health improvement plan process or um, the HRAP that we see. Uh, so there, this could, I'm just, I'm just wanting to have a firm understanding of what is implied by socioeconomic status and geographic location and what the extent uh, will be considered when we get to the commission. That's all. It's just a question and we'll come back to it. Lyons. Did somebody say something? Yeah, it's, it's Ann. Go for it. No, just wondering, when it says socioeconomic status, I'm just going back to my old, you know, uh, sociology tests. Are we going to be looking at socioeconomic status of non-BIPOC people? I, I'm, what I'm wondering is, is health status more a function of ethnicity, race, or is, is it as much a function of poverty or life, you know, and because if we're going, I think we need to know what we're going to attack to fix it.
Okay, this is a, Senator, I think this is a question that now we have recorded and as we go through and hear from folks, it'll be one to bring up. And I think there are people probably on, on YouTube with us now, on Zoom with us looking in who will be able to respond to your question. And that's why I'm raising these questions as we go forward. So either Susanna can help us or as we go through the bill further, we'll be able to get some clarification. Okay. Um, and I would just, um, Senator Cummings, refer you back also to the findings. I think the, the potential witnesses that you will hear will probably have um, great responses to that question, but also referring back to the findings, there's a lot of tie-in, particularly um, with the findings with regard to um, housing conditions for persons who are um, Black, Indigenous, and persons of color, and um, that tie in with socioeconomic status. So um, that's- I'm just wondering if as a balance um, that we would also look at per non-persons of color and do people in, e in the same socioeconomic status have the same health outcomes, you know, just trying to get at what is the root cause. Hmm. Otherwise, we kind of presume what the root cause is. Those are very good questions that will, and, and I think Department of Health may well be able to help us oh. either answer the question or to suggest data collection that would inform that. Good. Okay. So that brings us to subsection B, um, which is the purpose section. And the purpose is to eliminate disparities in health status based on race, ethnicity, disability, and LGBTQ status by establishing better and more consistent collection and access to data, enhancing the full range of available and accessible culturally appropriate healthcare and public services across Vermont, ensuring early and equitable inclusion of Vermonters who experience health inequities because of race, ethnicity, disability, and LGBTQ status and eliminates to F and efforts to eliminate such inequities. And lastly, addressing social determinants of health, particularly social, economic, and environmental factors that influence health. So that again, social determinants um, doesn't actually include economic or environmental. Okay. Some, you know, it's very well defined. So we, th that's when I, I do want to make sure that we're clear on it because we don't want confusion about what, about meaning there. Okay. Um, and the next section, we're creating a new chapter on health equity. And in this chapter, there's a definition section and then it's creating the commission that Representative Lippert was referring to. And although the um, commission itself plays kind of a short-term role in providing recommendations to set up the Office of Health Equity. It's an ongoing commission that has duties that extend far beyond the short-term goal of um, kind of giving guidance on the setup of the office. So, so the first section is um, the definition section. I won't spend too much time on the definitions at this point, and we can um, maybe go back and look at them in a bit more depth. I did wanna draw your attention to the fact that there's a social determinants of health definition and it seems that that's a, a place that you're interested in. So we might wanna spend some time looking at that when we come back to the language. Um, okay, so the next section is the creation of the advisory committee. Um, and in our first paragraph, paragraph, we kind of have the mission statement of this group. It's to promote health equity and eradicate health disparities among Vermonters including particularly those that are black, indigenous, and persons of color, individuals who are LGBTQ and individuals with disabilities. And the commission shall amplify the voices of impacted communities regarding decisions made by the state that impact health equity, whether in the provision of healthcare services or as a result of social determinants of health. And the advisory council is also to provide strategic guidance on the development of the Office of Health Equity, including recommendations on the structure, responsibilities, and jurisdiction of such an office. So that's kind of the, as I said, the mission statement of what this group is going to do and its long-term and short-term focus. 
And then we have the members of the advisory commission. Um, it's a long list um, and I know you have other witnesses. So for today, maybe I'll just um, say that there are representatives from the state and there is also an effort made in the healthcare committee to include representation um, from members of all the impacted communities um, on this list. So um, for today, I'll scroll past the list. Okay. Can, and subdivision. Question, just a quick question and something we probably may wanna raise with uh, Susanna when we get there. And that is we do have a chief prevention officer in uh, the agency of administration and so it may be that that person would offer some benefit to the commission and or uh, the prevention director or manager that we have in DOH. So just a, just a question uh, because the prevention officer does have some charges related to um, social determinants. And it could be a pretty, could be a nice relationship there. Okay. And I just wanted to flag for you that the last um, subdivision in this list of members includes any other members at large that the commission deems necessary to appoint to carry out the functions of this section, including ensuring equitable representation and balance between impacted communities and the healthcare provider perspective that healthcare provider perspectives are represented um, based on a majority vote of the members. Um, then in subdivision two, we have the term of the office appointed shall be three years with the exception that members at large shall have a term of one year. And of the members first appointed who are not designated as at large members, four are to be appointed for a one year term, four appointed for a two year term and 10 appointed for a three year term. So this is kind of um, that not all membership would turn over at the same time. There's a, a rolling membership. Um, Katie? Members would hold office. Katie? Oh, yes. Uh, it's Ruth, sorry to interrupt. I, it's, this is a huge commission. Um, are there, um, is there a, a sorry, a chair? Um, it, uh, or how do they choose a chair to run the meetings or whatever? Yeah, um, the bill that passed out of healthcare did have um, Susanna actually as the chair, um, the director, executive director of, of racial equity. And then there's amendment on the floor to allow the um, advisory commission itself to select a chair from among its membership. So that that is a piece that has had some conversation and some change um, since it left the healthcare committee. And we'll get to that language oh, shortly. So where Oh, it's not, we haven't gotten to it yet. Okay. And is there any type of sort of executive committee or smaller subgroup um, that, uh, um, that has, has a sort of separate uh, subgroup of powers? Sometimes with these huge commissions, there's often a set of, if there's need quickly or something does that in order to, um, I, I, I'm not suggesting we should do that. I'm just wondering if that was any ever discussed as. There was certainly a conversation about empowering the commission to organize itself, how it would, um, that it would be best suited to kind of determine the right structure for itself. Um, honestly, off the top of my head, I can't remember if there is language about creating subgroups. Um, and I'm sort of, well, we'll see when we get there. I, I don't remember that there's specific okay. language on subgroups, but um, my recollection is that there was a lot of conversation about empowering this group to find the right way to organize itself. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think Thanks. I think the commission does takes care of the... And in the absence of language on a subgroup, um, that doesn't, of course, preclude any subgroups. It's just not directive. Yeah, I'm just thinking committees and that kind of thing, if that's necessary to have in, or if that's just a given that these groups can make committees or executive committee or whatever. Mm -hmm. All right. So Thanks. I'm so Katie, uh, before we go further, I think um, Susanna Davis ha is under pressure with her schedule. So sure. I think let's interrupt at this point. We'll put a hold on the rest of the bill and we'll have Susanna uh, provide her testimony. Thank you for letting me know.
Yes, and thank you all for your flexibility. I apologize for interrupting the walkthrough. Um, oh, for the record, she's good. Okay. For the record, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. And um, I don't have prepared remarks today. I just thought I would come in and answer any questions you might have and speak a little bit about um, the, the, the purpose and the intended benefit of the creation of this office and the setup of the commission. I did want to follow up on a couple of the questions you all have already asked. Um, so I'll just take them in, in the order in which I recorded them. First, Madam Chair, you note in finding section number four, the social determinants of health, um, and I think also points number six and eight, if I recall, um, and just making sure that we've clearly defined that and that we're accurately reflecting the social determinants of health. Um, I just want to confirm that from my perspective and from my work in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in, in, in New York, that we do include all of those factors in social determinants of health. And I think the CDC also has things like environmental and economic uh, factors listed as well. So I would agree with the way that the bill findings lay out social determinants of health for what that's worth. The next one, um, the Senator asked if health disparity was more a function of race or of poverty and whether we'd be tracking socioeconomics of uh, people who are not people of color or just people of color. And um, personally, I would say, let's track everything we can. Um, you got data, I want it. And so the, um, I think it's important to track socioeconomic status for all people so that we can really get deep insight into the effects of poverty uh, or wealth into people's um, health outcomes. And just as an answer to that first question, disparity we often see is more a function of race than it is of poverty in the United States, not just in health, but in other factors. Because often when we control for socioeconomics, we still see deep, steep disparities. I'll give you one example um, related to income earning potential. We see, of course, disparities in lifetime earnings and income um, for, uh, let's say, Black Americans and white Americans. And that tends to be across the board. But when we control for socioeconomics, like if we have white children who grow up in the so-called 1%, the 1% top earners in the United States, compared to black children who grow up in the top 1% of earners in the United States, we still see that um, over time, they both will grow up to have a 12 point difference, a 12% difference in lifetime earnings where the white child who grew up in the 1% is still earning more than the black child who grew up in the 1%. And of course that's with economics, um, but the same ends up being true about health disparities. So it ends up being more, uh, race is a better predictor of life outcomes than poverty is, but I still strongly think that we should be tracking poverty metrics or wealth metrics for all groups. Um, the question was raised whether the chief prevention officer or the DOH prevention manager should or could have a role in this work. And um, without coming out and volunteering other people for, for more work, I would say there's absolutely a place for that in this. And to the extent that those people in offices have the capacity, they would be very, very welcome additions to this work. Um, and then commission chair selected by the body, yes. And I think that that's one of the ways in which we are really accomplishing process equity by um, doing a little bit less dictating in the statute how a, a group shall work with one another, but rather allowing that group to determine the path forward for itself to make sure that it works in a manner that suits it. So that amendment is, is one that I agree with. Um, and so that catches us up with those questions. I don't know if you had any others I could address, um, but I guess I just wanted to say generally about this bill that I, I strongly support the creation of an Office of Health Equity. Um, I, along with the advocates, remain disappointed that that is not a more immediate part of the bill. That is to say that we've deferred the setup of the Office of Health Equity for after the creation of the commission, although I understand the reason for it. Um, it's about capacity and bandwidth and, um, on, on the part of VDH, given the current activities they're focused on. And I mean, I, I know you all have heard me say this in different hearings and in different contexts, but I, people of color have been asked for so many years to wait for justice, for centuries really. And so while I recognize this, the, the incredible urgency with which we must act on these and other factors, I also believe that I'd rather take a little more time and get it right rather than get it done now. 
And so if we're not confident that we can um, set something up in a way that we're most proud of and in a way that's gonna be most efficacious, then let's take our time and do it right. And so, um, so for what that's worth, I think that um, going about it in this way allows us not only to begin doing some of the work that is the setup of the commission, but also if you look at the, the list of, of members of that commission and the partners with whom they're supposed to be working, it really presents us an opportunity actually doing it this way instead of doing them both simultaneously for those members of the commission and external partners to inform the setup and operation of the Office of Health Equity. So I think that presents us an opportunity to make sure that the office is being set up, not just based on what the state thinks is appropriate, but really incorporating the feedback of commission members and members of the public. And I think in the long run, when we talk about things like process equity and community sourced uh, governance, that, that might end up working very much in our favor. So I'll pause there and invite any feedback questions that you may have. So, you know, as you're, as you're talking through this issue and, um, the, and looking at the commission and then the fact that the commission can add folks and we'll have a, we'll have a long arm to reach out to educational institutions, um, to uh, medical uh, facilities and folks, and then might be recommend making recommendations uh, regarding how medical students are taught, how social workers are taught. I mean, it, you this could end up being a huge uh, work. Period. It's a it's a lot of work. I can see that. Uh, in addition to which, um, there's the whole area of the judiciary, which I know you're anxious to get to. Um, but the, uh, so uh, are, the, are the parameters designed in the, in the bill, the, the charge or the, the mission for the commission? A, are they a, too broad? Are they not broad enough, one? And uh, how, how specific, uh, this is hard. I mean, just how, how specific should they be? Are, are we asking for this commission to do a total and complete and thorough analysis of all the cultural defects? And I mean, they are defects and gaps and places for improvement. Is, is that what we're asking of this commission? This is a, a huge task. I think that we're not necessarily asking the commission to do all of that work and all of that analysis, but to play an advisory role in the office doing that analysis. And we, we know that the health department has already been doing health equity work for years, so they're, they're, they're well versed in it. Um, I think it's just about having a robust and intentional structure dedicated to that. Um, so the commission, I think, certainly would have a hand in identifying those shortcomings, or as you say, the, the defects. Um, but I think it's really about more the serving as an ancillary supportive role, doing things like grant making. So having that eye uh, on the outside and the external partners who could be of service and being able to help guide the trajectory of the work or at least um, help identify how we should focus it. It is a lot. And um, one of the things that I, um, that I'm grateful to Chair Lippert for being receptive to was um, my caution that while I recognize that we do a lot of our work based on timelines, that we allow for the flexibility here to make sure that if we do need to extend timelines that we can. Um, again, oftentimes, you know, rushed policy is rarely good policy. And so, um, so I think that the bill lays it out in a way that is fine. And if we determine that it's not quite fine in terms of timing, that we, um, that we have procedural grace um, and make sure that we empower the, the commission and eventually the office to have what it needs to get this right. I hope that's clear and that I didn't. Well, I, I think it will probably be made clear as we go through the bill. We haven't looked at the 
the kind of the forgiveness policy for timing yet, but uh, appreciate that thought. And uh, so, um, and I do think that uh, I understand what you're saying about social determinants, but we, we may come back to that simply because this committee has had experience in putting in place policies related to social determinants. And we wanna make sure that we're, we have consistency across our, um, our statutes. So that, that's why I raised that as an issue. Uh, Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Susanna, for being here today and your testimony. Um, I was scrolling through the rest of the bill just to see if I understood the duties of the commission. Or, uh, uh, and it sounds like a lot of the duties are to come up with what the duties of this new office should be. Is that, and then there are some ongoing duties of the commission after the office is set up. Um, and then your office has a large role in the whole thing. And we haven't gotten to the fiscal note yet, but I was just scrolling through that. Is there, it looks like you're tasked with making a budget request for next year for what you might need, but are there resources provided to your office in the FY22 budget in this bill or are they in a set, are they in the big bill or how, how is your office being resourced to do this work? Yes, so, um, so the proposal is um, put forward with the expectation that the separate um, funding proposal for two staff positions for the Office of Racial Equity be put in place. Absent that, it's, it's, it's not clear that this could happen, at least not in the time frame that we've, that we've carved out. So one would be those two staff positions coming to uh, or creating an office of racial equity. And then there's a, what I believe $180,000 um, note in there that would be for contracting with a third party contractor who can serve as a consultant in helping us to set up the commission and therefore get that, that ball rolling. Um, at some point after that, I get to step away once VDH comes in um, so my, my involvement really is, is more transitional than anything. Um, yes. Okay. And just in general, I mean, in, I, just the first read through of the bill, it reminds me a lot of a bill that we, we passed two years ago, Act, which came Act 1, that's a similar kind of charge and group working on the similar types of issues in our educational system. Um, and I think one thing that I'm happy to see in this bill is that in these two years, we have much more of a structure to do this work because of your office. Um, and there seems to be much more of a, you know, an infrastructure that will help this move forward um, in a way that we kind of struggled with, with that act one, two years ago. So um, it, if, so I guess acknowledgement of and, and appreciation for all the work you've done over the past two years that we can get a little further along um, and glad to see that we're doing this similar work in education and health and, you know, next the judiciary, perhaps there's just so many places to tackle. But um, and my, I guess my final question for you is, is there anything that you want to flag for us that you would like us to look into that either the house didn't get to or that we should uh, or maybe didn't do in the way you would want them to or you know something that we should change or people that didn't get heard from in the house that we should hear from no actually i i don't i'm grateful to the house for being um for making changes and updates that are reflective of the guidance that they heard from directly impacted communities and and from me as well i just suppose that i would um re reiterate to you all that for this to be as successful as it can be it's really going to be important that we trust communities enough to hand the reins over to them in making a lot of the determinations. So I think a lot of the sort of nuts and bolts questions that may be unanswered in the bill are really ripe for allowing members of the community, members of the commission to set those parameters. I know it's, it's difficult because we are people who love and make rules, um, but I think self-determination is a really big part of this, particularly in Vermont where we have an indigenous community that had largely had self-determination taken away from them. We saw yesterday the historic 
um, vote for the eugenics apology and, and so much of our health outcomes for people, especially the indigenous community, have had to do with um, not being able to make certain decisions for yourself. So I would just uh, reiterate the importance of that. And because you mentioned act one, I cannot help myself. I just, I have to plug the importance of us resourcing the act one group. Um, I, I sit on the committee, I see how hard people are working and how important it is. And um, it's, it's, it was a wonderful and important um, piece of legislation the work is happening, but it needs to be refueled in order to keep happening. So um, I'm putting in an act one plug here. Well, um, if you don't mind um, <laughs> communicating that in an email to Nelly and copy me, please. Will do. I, I think, and copy the chair of education. I, I think that was a bill that went through the education committee and I, I, I completely agree. And that's what I was sort of referencing the sort of infrastructure of that versus the infrastructure of this. Um, so good, good, good find Senator. Thank you. Any other questions for Susanna? I, I think Susanna it will be helpful to have you return as we go through the bill. If, if you have some time to do that, um, but you're obviously uh, very, a strong leader in this uh, and we need to have that um, input from you. So thank you. Very happy to return. Thank you for your flexibility and thank you for your time. All right, terrific. Good luck in the Judiciary Committee. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Um, uh, okay, so we'll, we'll just, we'll finish up going through the bill in the next five or six minutes. And, and then we're going to jump over to another topic. So, and Katie has a hard stop. So let's do that. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just skip ahead to the powers and duties of the commission. Yes. Okay. Um, so first the advisory commission shall provide guidance on the development of the office, which is to be established based on the commission's recommendations as soon as it's fiscally practicable to do so. And the specific guidance will include the structure responsibilities and jurisdiction of the office, whether the office is to be independent, and if not, in which state agency or department it should be situated, how the office is to be staffed, the population served and specific issues addressed by the office, the duties of the office, including how grant funds shall be managed and distributed, and the time frame and necessary steps to establish the office. Um, other responsibilities include providing advice and making recommendations to the office once it has been established, um, including input on rules and policies proposed by the office, um, awarding of grants and the development of programs and services, the needs, priorities, programs and policies relating to the health of the um, impacted communities and any other issue that the Office of Equity, Health Equity requests the assistance from the advisory commission on. Um, also, the Advisory Commission is responsible for reviewing, monitoring, and advising all state agencies regarding the impact of current and emerging state policies, procedures, practices, laws, and rules on the impacted communities, identifying and examining the limitations and problems associated with existing laws, rules, programs, and services related to the health status of the impacted populations, advising the Health Department on any funding decisions related to eliminating health disparities and promoting health equity, including distribution of federal monies related to COVID. The extent funds are available for the purpose of distributing grants that stimulate the development of community-based and neighborhood-based projects that will improve health outcomes for impacted populations. And lastly, advising the General Assembly on efforts to improve cultural competency and anti-racism in the healthcare system through training and continuing education requirements. And we'll come back to that piece because there's um, kind of a, a short-term report back on this piece. Okay, Jenny. Senator Lyons. Yes. Yeah, what I didn't hear in there is how the office is going to be paid for. I may have missed it, but we just talked about how we're underfunding all of these things and now we're starting a new program and I didn't hear anything about how the how this new department would be paid for 
Well, that's so something think, we can ask and, and we can add that. Uh, with yeah, I mean, I think, I, yeah, uh, it's a, it's an important point. You can't have an office without some resources. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. Just in the interest of time, I'll um, kind of move over some of the more technical aspects of creating the commission. There is a section on data responsiveness to health equity inquiries. Um, I'll just flag that as something that we should come back to. The section four um, amends the existing duties of the executive director on racial equity to include the new duty of temporarily overseeing the establishment of this advisory commission until the office is up and running. Um, and then in section five, there's a short a report in the short term from the commission it's to come back October 1, 2022, and it's to consult with various licensing boards and professional organizations. Um, and it's regarding um, recommendations for improving cultural competency and anti-racism in Vermont's healthcare system through initial training, continuing education requirements and investments. So that ties in with the last duty um, on the commission's list of duties. Um, and then as um, I believe Senator Lyons mentioned, there is language in the report um, about asking the um, commission to make a budget recommendation to fund its work in fiscal, for fiscal year 2023, if necessary, to continue its work. Okay. Um, yeah, sometimes, you know, the work just extends to the time allowed, but so that'll be a, but we also want it to be well done. That I, I also have, a, I have another question. Um, yeah, so Katie, I, I, I haven't memorized a bill yet, but, um, and, and I may not do that, but the, um, the issue of, this is actually about health, right? Is there anything in here, there is in here about determinants of health, social determinants of health. Is there anything in here about uh, collecting data that identify the causes and influences for health disparities among these different groups? But we'll have to, there's I guess whole, it's an open question we can look at. Okay, there's a whole section on, on data okay. um, that I, I went over very quickly just because I, I'm yeah. scheduled to be in another committee at this time. Um, um, but this section, subsection A, each state agency department board or commission that collects health related individual data is to include in its data collection health equity data disaggregated by race, ethnicity, gender identity, age, primary language, socioeconomic status, disability, and ori sexual orientation. Data related to race and ethnicity is to use separate collection categories and tabulations disaggregated beyond white and non-white in accordance with the recommendations made by the Executive Director of Racial Equity. And then there's language that the Department of Health is to systematically analyze this data um, health equity data using the smallest appropriate unit of analysis feasible to detect racial and ethnic disparities, um, as well as disparities along the lines of the categories that we just went through, um, and to report on the results of this analysis on its website periodically, but not less than biannually. And the department's analysis is to be used to measure over time the impact of actions taken to reduce health disparities. Okay. I don't want to keep you. I'm also, I've also been thinking about how um, we'll have to go through the bill again, but just, just how this commission interacts with, for example, the Prevention Council. I mentioned the Chief Prevention Officer, but there is the whole Prevention Council, and maybe, maybe there's some, something to be gained by uh, changing the constituency of the Prevention Council, not not right away, but going forward. So just, just, I'll have to remember that. All right. All right. And so just one last comment. This did not go to ha House Human Services. I don't believe so. No, I didn't yeah. do a walkthrough with them. Okay. Did it go you. to appropriations? Yes. Okay. They have $180,000 I think is what Representative Lippert said in the budget set. Right, aside. and that's to do, that's probably one time money. It is, it sounds like. Okay. 
yeah. but somewhere we're going to have to talk about how we pay for an ongoing department. Yes. And that, and the, so I think the original bill established CMEs for um, physicians and others uh, to train for cultural competency. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a goal here is to have some um, training for healthcare providers to ensure that they understand differences. So I'm, I know that that's a goal for some of the folks. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if we have already determined what the outcome is going to be if we're provide if we've already talking about providing training before we've determined that that's the problem. I mean, I. Yeah, I think these are these are really important questions for us to ask, and uh, because you're, what you're saying, we don't want to. That's really not good science. That's bias discrimination. Right. If we yeah, if we've I already understand. determined what the answers are, then why bother doing the study? If we're doing the study to find out the answers, why are we putting in a solution before we define the problem? Well, and I, I want to move us off the conversation. However, um, I remember a research project that I started uh, years ago on uh, discriminatory practices in the sciences. So it was on gender-based discrimination. And I started out thinking, I know what I'm going to find, right? And I went through uh, a long period of data collection and qualitative and quantitative data collection. And lo and behold, wow, was I surprised. It was completely different from what I had anticipated. So we would hope that that um, sort of disinterested objectivity might prevail with a group like this. We don't know, so we'll find out. All right, Senator Hardy, last question. It's, it's mostly just a comment um, that I don't think, I think we already know that there are, that, that there are disparities yeah. that are the result of racism and discri discrimination and um, homophobia, et cetera. Oh. And um, we, it, that is clear. The data is absolutely clear. And that's what the first 11 pages of the bill is. This study is, is more about how do we, what in our structure of the provision of healthcare in Vermont and the oversight of healthcare in Vermont um, needs to change as because of the data that already shows that these disparities exist. And then creating an office that will help improve and do away with those disparities that can be distinctly an office about um, you know, sol helping to solve the problem. Um, so I, I don't see it as a study of trying to figure out do these health disparities exist? We already know they do. There's no question that they exist. And, and so it's, it's moving beyond that question as a way of how do we change our so, structures to, to address yes, the problem. You're, you're absolutely right. I think what Senator Cummings' comment was, um, if, if we know that there are disparities and people are walking into it with ready-made solutions, or they they are automatically know what the solution should be, then why, why do it? So, our goal is to try and sort out that we're going to that this group is going to evaluate what the issues are and maybe not come up with the pat solution. There might be something completely unexpected. That's all. Huh. Okay. So, very good comment. Good, good, good discussion. We're, we're going to get back to this uh, another time. Unless I hear differently from the committee, we'll keep working on this bill as well. Um, and we'll have to, we'll, it'll, it'll also be something that appropriations uh, will be working on because there is an appropriation with it. So we have with us, um, 
part two of options for regulating provider reimbursement. And uh, so Robin, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, committee, are you interested in a one minute stretch? Yes. I think it would be helpful for a comeback, a, a two minute stretch. So at 1110, uh, with great apologies to Robin and Elena and uh, Sarah that will just take a very quick two minutes. Nellie, we're... Thank you.